Talk about growing up in New Jersey and the early football influences for you. When television first started, I can remember first seeing Marty Glickman and he had a show called The Giant Quarterback Huddle and they would bring some of the players on, Charlie Conley or Alex Webster, they were like guests in there. And I can remember not being able to wait for that show to come on. So now as a kid growing up in Hasbro Heights and watching the Marty Glickman show, now you have a chance to go coach with the New York Giants. What was that like for you professionally and personally? You know, that was my team. It was who I lived and died with all the way from young boy through college. It was exciting to go there, very exciting. When you go first as an assistant, growing up, knowing the Giants history and knowing about Sam Huff and how the Giant defense would be introduced because they were really the stars. And now you're in charge of the Giants defense. It must have, you understood what it meant. Without question. Uh, and we were changing philosophies to a three, three man line. And, and uh, of course we got Lawrence and, and uh, Jim Burt and several other guys that year. And there were a period of about two or three years there where you put that defense in front up there and they couldn't block any of them. And that's a pretty secure feeling as a coach to, to have a defense up there where they couldn't block any of them. When you first got the nod to be the head coach of the New York Giants, uh, you go from defensive coordinator to now it's your show. What was that like and was it intimidating well, Again, at all? it was very exciting, but I was really... I made a couple of critical errors there my first year. And uh, one of them was not really just being myself. I was trying to be a head coach and I thought I was supposed to do things a certain way. And of course that didn't work out well. And we changed a lot of people after that 83 season. A lot of people, probably half the squad. You made it pretty clear going into 84 that it was gonna be done a certain way, your way. After 83, you know, there was some uh, more than strong rumors that I was going to be let go and they were going to hire someone else. And when I did get the opportunity, I said, well, if they're going to get me, it's going to be on my terms. Fortunately, I had a good support system there with the Giants and the whole organization got behind me and, and I probably wasn't too easy to get behind in those days. Some of these guys got to get their head out of their ass around here. A little bit mercurial, a little bit brusque would be the word. What the f are you doing staying 10 yards in the backfield? Get up on the line! Don't you know how much time's on the clock? And I was probably pushing the envelope harder than I should have, more determined than I ever was. Fortunately, things fell in place, and we started winning pretty regularly. You know, everyone thinks of Parcells and, you know, good running game and strong defense. But you looked at your team in 84 and you said, I got this guy Sims. He gives us the best chance right now. He throws for over 4,000 yards. What was the thought process behind putting the ball in his hand and letting it him run? It felt like we needed to get more bigger, bigger plays. So I wanted to try to get a little more impetus in our offense. And now, I wouldn't say we're a big play team, but we could throw the ball down the field, and that's really what I was interested in doing. The relationship with the great Phil Simms and, and how it evolved and... We needed each other, I think. I needed him. I needed someone like him. He understood me. Phil, look, at, when we call the, the, the Y-10, that's who we're trying to throw to. I, I, don't Bill, don't they, be too inventive, okay? Okay, they took him. He was not sensitive. He could take it. I could use him as a whipping boy on purpose, which I would. Now, he was fiery, so he would respond. Hey, Phil, I'll run the game. I, know, I don't know who you're sending in. I'm sending goal line in, well, bud. somebody give me something. Okay. Right. I ain't got time to Signal. make a call. You, you take who you want. I'll take him. We'll line up and we'll play. I'll play him. As you go to the 85 playoffs, um, you know, the Bears having a great season. Did you think you guys were good enough to beat them? Yeah, maybe two or three out of 10. 
that day. And they could have been had that day. They could have been had that day, but we made a couple critical errors. Landetta from his end zone. Bears look at good field position. Oh, he missed it! This is the football! He missed it's it! The field. Oh, all right! It's Sean Gale! That game was fr exasperating to me because when it was over, I felt like a couple of years' work was kind of out the window. I really did. I felt like, gee whiz, we got to get all the way back to this, doing this again here. I don't know whether we could, you know, every, you, when you're that experienced that now, this is my second time through the playoffs, you know how hard it is to get where we were. And so that's what kind of frustrated me after that game. All of your players have referred to the fact of the offseason of 86 and after that loss from the 85 playoff game the resolve that each guy felt individually that we're gonna go right to work and you know we're not leaving any stone unturned did you get a sense that that was well, a collective I'll give you the best example George Martin's wife Diane God bless her called me up and she said George has been playing a long time now coach I want him to retire she said, but if you ask him to play, he's going to play, so I'm going to ask you, please don't ask him. And I didn't even bat an eye. I said, Diane, I'm going to ask him. And, of course, George played four more years after that. So now you get to that next step, the NFC Championship game and the Washington Redskins and, you know, the third time. Well, that was, that was our fiercest rival. And of course, the elements were so much a factor of that day and wound up being a tremendous advantage. Probably the difference in the game for us, our ability to do things in the elements that Washington just couldn't do. We drove the ball into a 35 or 40 mile an hour wind in the third quarter for a touchdown. We kicked off to start the game and got a quick 10 nothing lead. But that, that touchdown drive into the wind in the third quarter was the difference in the game because it took all the time off the clock for them to have the wind advantage. And after that, it was just, once it was 17, nothing the quarter changed, I knew they couldn't pass. After what you went through in 83 and then the baby steps in 84 and 85, now you've won the NFC Championship game and you're going to the well, Super Bowl. Well, now it's something new because it's exciting again, but it's also the unknown because I hadn't been to a Super Bowl as a coach, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do, and I'm trying not to leave a stone unturned. And you practice so well out in Pasadena. Were you scared that, you know, I know you love boxing, that you might leave it in the gym? We practiced very well for the Super Bowl. We'd put a lot into getting ready six or seven practices. I knew we were ready to go. So your defense gets a goal line stand in the first half. They won Luckily. It. Yeah, they won it missing the field. Why do you say luckily? Well, because that game could have got out of hand. It was already getting close to being out of hand. And uh, had they gone up 17, you know, up to 17, you never know. And it is so good! I told the team at the half, I said, hey, so we're lucky. We, fellas, let's not give this game away here. I said, we're, let's just go play, come on. Did you guys know how well Sims was playing? Oh yeah, I knew he was playing well. Uh, he told me in warm-ups he was ready to rock. Whatever you, he just, I mean, I remember him saying, whatever you want to do, Bill, let's do it. Pitch, Morrister turns around, back to Sims, on the flea flicker. Sims is looking way downfield, he's got a receiver, complete, down to the 10, five, touchdown, I believe. And the one. Mark at the one. Still in the pocket of the one yard line. The Super Bowl champions, of the Giants, the Giants have accomplished something that many people thought they would never see. What were you thinking the first time they dumped Gatorade on you? Harry became the guy to do it. Well, I think Bert and Harry were original because, but then Harry made it a, you know, a festive thing. Carson has changed shirts and is in the security uniform now. And there it comes. I had been on them so bad. So when you know when you do some things, you got to be let, ready to let them do some things. Coaches are always thinking, what's next? Well, there is no next game. Were you able to enjoy it? 
to its fullest. Team party after the game. Charlie Connolly comes up, sits down next to me, puts his arm around me, tell me how proud he is. Charlie Connolly. 87 ruined strike, the whole thing. You know, it's just not a good year. Your nucleus is strong though because the drafts continually are good. 90, you have that good nucleus of the guys that you won with in 86, plus now you have the young veterans. You had Otis running back, you drafted Hampton, who was... Still had Tim Tillman and Maggot. Tillman and Maggot. We were ready to go. You, and Hampton's giving you that youthful burst, um, and you rattle off 10 in a row. The superstitious, the coach Parcells, were you allowing yourself to think where you might go with this? No. Or you just wanted it? No, time? we took a bad beating in Philly the next week. A, a game Bavaro got ejected from. We didn't play well, and we weren't really sharp. You know, 10 wins, it gets, there's a psychology that takes over, and it's not good, and you got to get punched in the mouth, and that's what happened. And we didn't, we got beat again. And it took us a while to get back on track, and then we lost Phil. Sims is down and getting up slowly. Sims is starting to limp off the field here. It's a first down for the Giants. Now we'll get Jeff Hostetler. What did you and your staff know about Hostetler that we didn't? Intelligent, mobile, competitive. Hostetler looking for a receiver right, looks left, throws, end zone, deep Baker. Touchdown! What a call. Cool Hostetler turns, rolls left, looking, throws, end zone. Touchdown! I wouldn't say battle tested, but experienced enough that he should be functional provided we gave him a chance to succeed. We have to alter something specifically for Jeff to allow him to use his ability more than we would have done with Sims. Bootlegs, and we're not gonna be doing that with Sims as much as with Jeff. These little things that we had in there for him helped and helped us win, and he executed them very well. So you're going into the playoffs in 90 without your starting quarterback, and Hampton then gets hurt. After the 10 and 0 and taking a couple beatings and then everybody getting hurt, the Giants went off the radar screen, which was perfect for those vets that we had because they responded like they always did. Oh yeah, well we'll see about it. And that's what happened. We did see about it. Well, that takes us to the NFC Championship game now. And here you are. Greatest game I've ever coached in. Tough battle. No one thinks you can win on the road. I mean, it's perfect. Hostetler's toughness. I mean, you knew about it, you had used got it. Got beat you know, up in that game. Got really beat, got knocked out of the game. Yeah, I had to put Matt in. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, but he came back and, hey, he made the play to Stephen Baker there on the sideline, put us in full field goal range. Maybe not the most aesthetically pleasing to the eye, but to me, it was bliss. How important was it that you'd already played Buffalo? Very important. Feel, a better feel. I remember Bill Belichick and myself talking about the pace, how we had to do a better job with the pace of the game because uh, that we had we had to do some things to try to slow that pace a little bit. We had run, a, run the ball pretty well on Buffalo in preseason for a lot of yards, and we felt like we could shorten the game on them. Not like those nine and 10 minute drives myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are, that's players executing. That's Megat, that's Ingram, that's Hostetler, that's, you know, Stephen Baker, that's converting short yardages. That's football. That's not one big play, one thing. That is sustained execution, sustained mental concentration. You know how hard that is to do for 20 straight minutes? Well, that's what they did. Coming, going in at the half and coming out to start the third quarter. That's why they call them champs. Are you too caught up in the moment to enjoy it as it's happening? Scott Norwood, he can fire the shot heard round the world now. They're lining up to kick this field goal, and I'm saying to myself, you know, it would be a shame if we lose this game because we outplayed them so badly. And 
and still, they still had an opportunity to their credit to win. As uh, Banks and Lawrence are carrying you off the field in Tampa, are you too caught up in the moment to enjoy it as it's happening? That was really satisfying to win with that. After losing your quarterback, everybody said you can't win without your starting quarterback. Well, Jeff Austin proved that wrong. Bill, take it away. <laughs> so when you think about it, here you are, Hasbrookites. You're a Giant fan growing up as a kid. You become the head coach of the Giants. One of the Giants coaches is Vince Lombardi, another New York guy. And your name is on two trophies. New York Giant, Vince Lombardi trophy, and the head coach is Bill Parcells. In your wildest dreams. No, of course not. God's been good to me, Bob. He really has. He's been very good to me. I've been very fortunate. I mean, I never felt like I had a real job. It's the truth. It's always been fun, just go. You got your guys and you got your team. I still have it. You have all these great experiences and you've had success, you know, in all the other places that you've gone. You've, you've rebuilt, you've fixed, you've gotten teams to successful points. You've fixed every place that you've been. But the bottom line is, Giant fans still consider you their coach. Even, even though you well, went to the, you're well, their guy, because you're well, a decade. Well. That's, I appreciate that very much because you can't dismiss what happened there. The rest of your life, the rest of your life, man, nobody could ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did it. In my heart, that's what I am, a giant. There's a whole generation, you know? There's, there's your youth and then there's me growing up during the horrible, I mean, it, it can't, you know, my first recollections are 70, 71, 72, right. I mean, I it's, it's horrible. I've been there for all of it, right. Bob, I got it. <laughs> and you were, you were a central figure in rejuvenating a fan base. Well, I appreciate that. I had a lot of help. I had a good support system, a good front office, tremendous ownership. I couldn't ask for any more. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Bill Parcells for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Winners assemble as a team. Well, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I get to do just that. I'm honored, I'm grateful, and I'm thankful to every single one of you out there that had something to do with this. Thank you very much. Wellington Camaro said, once a giant, always a giant. Tell me what it means to you. Pretty much everything that I have in this world is because of the Maros and the family and the opportunity that they gave me. As I think back on things and my time, a place in your heart always reminds me that once you're a giant, you're always a giant. <laughs>